Well, let me just say it is such a pleasure finally to have Jim here talking to us. So we've been after him for, it feels like years, maybe only to him, but we're chasing, chasing, chasing you know, travel schedules. And uh, we finally got a, a date and then that was interrupted by COVID and then repeatedly interrupted. So we're finally going just to, you know, take the treasure without the, the person, uh, his mind and uh, 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 do it all video. Uh, as his title today, and Jim, as I think everyone knows, but let me just tell you, he, he covers an incredibly wide range of things. He's made you know, pretty foundational contributions to our understanding of class relations and anarchism, but also just more generally, uh, politics, hegemony, how to think about power, a bunch of not, important things in, in, in comparative political economy, especially agrarian societies a very, very wide range of, of intellectual interests and contributions. The books which are listed in, in somewhere in uh, uh, Vita I'm looking at include Arts of Resistance, Seeing Like a State, Two Cheers for Anarchism, The Art of Being Governed, and, and then Against the Grain. And Against the Grain is uh, in some ways uh, the best title because it sort of sums up uh, Jim's uh, whole attitude and uh, and work in a way. It's it's not looking for mindless contrarianism, but it, it really has a very deeply built-in shockproof uh, shit protector, as, as Hemingway regarded something or used uh, about another thing. And, and it is certainly unfailingly courageous in just cutting through, uh, often not even deferring to uh, different, uh, I don't know, uh, habits of mind, uh, especially on the left, uh, I would not read him in any way as a as a as a conservative or certainly a reactionary thinker. But uh, uh, but now we've all learned, I think, uh, to doubt some of uh, the achievements of the affirmative state and and are recognizing more and more things are complex and not just complicated and are more and more aware of you know, the surveillance state and all the different ways uh, we, we can be oppressed and enshrined in, in you know, self-reproducing often unconsciously the power relations in which we, against which we protest. And now that, in other words, we're all sort of kind of libertarian socialists or, or something or other. Uh, I, I only hope that his, uh, his uh, long skepticism and, and de deep scholarship gets an even broader hearing. Anyway, talk about contrary titles, everything flows in praise of floods. Uh, Jim, let me hand it over right to you. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. Um, I should add that I, uh, as a peasant scholar, um, UW gave me my start. It was my first job from 1967 uh, to 1976. And in fact, the Land Tenure Center, um, sponsored me, gave me a course relief so I could teach a course on peasants. Um, I've, I've been ever grateful. And so I consider myself to be a project of Gene Havens and the Land Tenure Center uh, and so on. Um, so uh, this is, uh, as everybody says, this is part of a book uh, that's true in this case. And I've only written the first chapter of this book that is about the Irrawaddy River in Burma by and large, but about rivers in general. And in fact, the terrible events in Burma, the military coup have slowed me down as I've tried to do what I can from a distance to help the democratic forces uh, in Burma. So let me turn to the actual subject. I have been teaching a seminar on rivers. I call it rivers, nature and politics for the past seven or eight years. And historically, I've done a lot of fishing and canoeing on rivers, including the Wolf River, I might add. Um, but I date the germ of this talk to a conversation I had with a hydrologist about 20 years ago. I happened to find myself at a large conference site in which two meetings were taking place simultaneously. One meeting was of professional hydrologists on the one hand, and the other were Southeast Asianists. I, of course, was uh, in the Southeast Asianist side of that conference. 
And uh, although the meetings were separate, we had lunch and dinner together and we were instructed by the hosts to sit among one another and carry on conversations across disciplines. I found myself sitting uh, next to a very smart uh, Philippine hydrologist. And uh, I, being a good little boy at the conference, I tried to make conversation with him. And I had just learned a few years before that the Colorado River never got to the sea of Cortez uh, for much of the year. And I had this lingering sense of sadness for the Colorado River that it didn't get to go to the sea. All our poems about rivers running to the sea. It seemed, and I, just to start the conversation, I said to the Philippine hydrologist that I just learned the sad fact um, that the Colorado River didn't get to the sea and uh, wasn't it a shame? And he dropped his knife and fork on the plate and turned his chair toward me and said, no, no, no. It's the most, it's the best thing that could possibly happen. It means that not a single drop of water goes to waste and every drop is used for important human purposes. So I realized that this man and I were not going to have a long conversation. Um, and it got me thinking about the way one thinks of rivers as on the one hand, um, as natural resources, as just so much H2O that has to be divided between different users. And the river as the life world of many life forms who depend on it besides Homo sapiens, for example. Uh, he was not alone, by the way. Um, uh, and I wanna quote Winston Churchill uh, speaking about the Nile River. Uh, Winston Churchill wrote, one day, every last drop of water which drains into the whole valley of the Nile shall be equally and amicably divided among the river people and the Nile itself shall perish gloriously and never reach the sea. Joseph Stalin had the same idea about rivers, but in a less lyrical vein, he wrote, water which is allowed to enter the sea is wasted. You could have had an answer like this from anyone in the American Bureau of Reclamation or the Army Corps of Engineers had you asked them any time up to 20 years ago. Um, but rivers are a lot. Let me share um, screen. There we go. Um, uh, uh, this, by the way, is a map by James Fisk, uh, published, he was uh, worked for the Corps of Engineers, actually. Uh, and this is one of a series of 18 maps, which is the meander belt of the Mississippi over the last two or 3,000 years. Um, and they did something like, uh, 16,000 core samples in this meander belt from Indiana all the way to New, New Orleans, essentially. Um, and we're able to establish almost all of the ancient channels and meanders of the Mississippi River. Uh, not only is it a beautiful piece of abstract painting at, from one perspective, but it is the best illustration in its time-lapse photography, if you like, or time-lapse mapping uh, of a river that to most of us is always rep represented on a map that would just trace the current channel of the Mississippi River. Um, let me, how do I? That's another uh, map of the Meander Belt. Um, the, uh, the, this image is, um, again, to emphasize the movement of rivers, this is uh, the Yellow River from 2000 BC uh, up until 2001 and all the various channels. There's something like 480 kilometers between the southernmost channel and the northernmost channel of the Yellow River. And they all originate in this area in the center. 
where you have a floodplain with a very, very low gradient um, and the river shifts course radically at different times. The second to last shift of the Yellow River uh, took place in 1938 and it was deliberate in the sense that Chiang Kai-shek blew up the dikes uh, to send the Yellow River south of the Shandong Peninsula in order to slow the Japanese advance, which it did slow the Japanese advance, but it cost the lives of something like 300,000 uh, Chinese in the process. So I want to emphasize that everything moves in a larger sense. That is to say, if you open the temporal lens wide enough, everything, literally everything is in movement. That is to say, if we go back to ge ancient geological time, the tectonic plates, the ground under our very feet uh, has shifted radically uh, over time. If you look at the polar ice cap, um, and its various um, uh, configurations. It grows enormously and shrinks enormously. Uh, and the last glacial maximum was something like 20,000 years ago before the current uh, warming period. Uh, and other things that we think of as being stationary are moving as well. So after the last glacial maximum, when the Holocene became warmer and warmer, um, trees, oaks, and beaches that were in refugia along the Mediterranean uh, Sea, they started marching north little by little by little and bringing with them their soils, the animals, the insects, uh, the microbiotic uh, uh, companions that they had and they moved steadily north. Um, so if you open that temporal lens wide enough, uh, the, everything that looks as if it's just uh, stationary uh, actually moves. Our problem, I think, in this respect is that we, of course, operate by human time, and the default unit of time for us is a human lifespan, uh, or under the most charitable view, um, the lifespan of our parents, us, and our children, and that is to say three generations. And we need to start thinking in terms of human time, and certainly climate change, um, this pushed us in that direction. The process of the change in the Yellow uh, River, for example, is a natural process. That is to say, the North China Plain is so flat that the river slows down. And as it slows, it carries and settles out all the sediment that it has carried. Over time, it is therefore self-damming, that is to say, as it slows down, it drops sediment and it blocks its own way. It creates its own levee ahead of it. And then it spreads laterally and seeks another path to the sea. As a new channel is clogged, the river may go back to an older channel that is now a faster route to the sea. This process is natural, though the amount of sediment can be vastly increased by say deforestation of the watershed, which is the case in the Yellow River. Um, and of course, the river is likely to build new land in the estuary uh, when it deposits its final load of sediment. Each flood raises the land flooded by the deposition of sediment so that the floodplain, for example, in the middle Nile today is 10 feet higher than it was 5,000 years ago. George Perkins Marsh understood this, by the way, in 1861. Um, in his book, Man and Nature. For this reason, a lot of river port towns and coastal towns at a river's mouth are vulnerable to being blocked by the buildup of silt and sand. Bruges, the great linen center, is a striking example. Its river artery for trade, the Zwin River, silted up in the 15th century and all the merchants left town to go to Antwerp. It left then this urban gem and museum piece of the 15th century that we admire today. Brizac on the upper Rhine in Roman times was on the left bank of the Rhine. In the 10th century, it was on an island. In the 13th century, it was on the left bank again. And in the 14th century and since the 14th century, it has remained on the right bank. This has happened historically to thousands and thousands 
of river towns over time as they've had to adjust um, the, to the changes in the river. I had the idea based on a long series of summers spent along um, a stream in central Pennsylvania, the idea that rivers moved gradually by accretion. That is to say, every year in the spring, the ice would gouge out uh, a bend a little more uh, and fill in the opposite side of that bend a little more and gradually would eat away at some land and create other land. However, uh, I was wrong in the sense that uh, the 1972 flood uh, of that central Pennsylvania, I realized that 99% of the change in the rivers, in that stream's bed and the new channels and the cutting off of meanders happened in the high water period um, of that particular flood. Uh, so that in international relations uh, law, this is called avulsion rather than accretion. Um, so that the changes that characterize a river are likely to be the product of extremely high water periods um, when the when the river is, if you, if you like, at its most, most active. Um, let me, um, that's another picture of the Yellow River, um, but just from 1985 and all the micro channels that it carved at different times. Um, this is a picture of uh, oxbows um, and you're all familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, and the meander scars that are created over time. There is a sinuosity and hydrological logic to the speed of the water around all these loops that lead them to eat into the outside part of the loop um, and to deposit sediment on the inside of the loop uh, to the point where uh, at high water, the um, the collar between um, uh, at, at the bottom of one of these loops is likely to be breached uh, during flood tide uh, and thereby create an oxbow um, lake. Here's an actual photograph of uh, oxbow lake uh, in the foreground and to the left, uh, a, if you like, uh, wannabe oxbow uh, probably waiting for a flood in the relatively near future. Um, my understanding of rivers moving all the time was um, impressed on me when I spent a good deal of time on the Irrawaddy River. And this is a picture. The Irrawaddy River is, if you like, the super highway of Burman culture. Um, the same religion, the same language with its various dialects and so on, um, is uh, uh, characterizes both the upper course of that river all the way down to the Irrawaddy Delta uh, and floodplain near Rangoon. Um, in the course of just one trip during low water from Mandalay to the ancient capital of Pagan, uh, I found myself in a small inboard motorboat that carried no more than 20 passengers. However, in the course of an eight hour sail, we used four pilots. The captain who'd sailed this uh, particular route for a long, long time did not trust himself um, to navigate it without pilots. So at a village uh, shortly after we started, we picked up a pilot uh, and each pilot of the four pilots we had was a specialist in one little section of the river. And when his knowledge ran out, we would stop and let him out and take on at that village, another pilot who would help us through and navigate the, the narrow channels um, of the river for the next hour and a half or two and so on through four different um, uh, stretches. The captain simply did not trust himself to navigate the 
sandbars and shifting and shallow bottom that was always changing. Uh, the bigger cargo ships, the danger was even greater. So um, this picture uh, is mostly intended to show you the bamboo pole. And at the uh, prow of all of the ships in, at low water, there are two people who uh, use these bamboo poles, which are marked by the number of uh, feet that they represent. And they will call back to the captain uh, something like under four feet, over four feet, uh, and so on. Uh, and very much like uh, how Mark Twain got his uh, um, pen name uh, on the Mississippi, of, in which the marking was on a rope rather than on a bamboo pole. But it's the same, uh, same situation. Um, however, it was very common for uh, boats to get uh, stuck anyway. Uh, and it was particularly difficult if they were traveling downstream because the current then embedded them in a sandbank and it was hard to back off. Uh, this happened and I happened to catch a picture of it. Uh, you see these people, they've been put off the boat. You can see how shallow the, uh, the water is. They found a particularly shallow place. What they're doing is putting a stake as deeply as they can embed it in the mud, that uh, stake will then be attached to a cable uh, and that to a winch at the stern of the boat, which will then wiggle itself back and forth using its engines and try to back off the sand. There are occasions when this doesn't work, in particularly boats carrying uh, teak logs, and they simply have to wait for the next monsoon um, in order to. Uh, move again. So one of the things that this should impress us with is whenever you hear someone talk about a 50 year flood or a 100 year flood or 500 year flood for that matter, uh, you should not take this very seriously. That is to say, for most rivers, we simply do not have the statistical series going back far enough to make any statistical um, predictions uh, about how frequently floods occurred uh, in a, a distant past. That for the Yangtze or Yellow River or the Rhine or the Danube, uh, we do have a longer series, but still not enough to make very reliable predictions. But most important, of course, um, is that even if we did have a deep series, the assumption behind a 50 year and 100 year flood uh, is that is the assumption of hydrological equilibrium. That is to say that we're dealing with the same river year by year. And as Heraclitus told us, you can't step into the same river twice. That is to say, it's not the same river from year to year. It's moving silt and sand and clay. It's carving new channels and meanders uh, and it's, it, in its normal flood stage, it's building natural levees. And if we add anthropogenic changes, which are uh, the most radical, uh, it's definitively not the same river. In 1800, most of the Mississippi bank was forested. In 1960, 95% of that river was in agricultural crops. The effects of this on erosion, on runoff, on the speed of the water, uh, how long it took for a drop of water falling in, this, in Minnesota to get down to New Orleans was, was cut by two thirds. Um, the point is that um, these rivers have been sculpted both by their own natural processes and by um, Homo sapiens, and I might add in the context of Wisconsin and North America by beavers as well, who were later exterminated. Um, and the fact is that um, these rivers have, as hydrological systems have changed absolutely radically. And I think um, that I am ready to claim 
that sedentism and agriculture are probably more consequential for rivers even than industrialization. Um, that is to say, uh, it so changed by its deforestation that sedentism required for metallurgy, for ceramics, for heating and cooking and the increase in population. Um, you had then, if you like, a, um, a change, partly because people did settle by rivers uh, almost entirely uh, until the railroads, all cities were essentially riverine cities uh, or at the coast. And usually if they were at the coast, they would be at the estuary of a river and at the coast. Um, the, um, now I want to, to talk about the most important part of river movement, and that is the flood pulse. Um, this is the origin of the title in praise of floods. Um, that is to say, um, most of our work on rivers is about homo sapiens interest in the rivers and not on the life forms that depend on the river uh, for uh, their life. The most important movement in the annual life of a river is the flood pulse. That part of the year during which the river overflows its channel and banks and occupies its habitual floodplain. The pulse of high water may come from the monsoon or from snow or glacial melt or from seasonal rainfall. And it may be of different degrees of variability, but it is a completely natural part of the annual cycle of a river. The flooding of the floodplain represents the lungs of a river. And I mean that in a pretty literal sense. That is to say, the condition of its vitality and that of the creatures who depend on it. Without the annual flooding of the floodplain, the channel, which we usually associate with the river at rest in paintings and on maps, is comparatively dead, biotically speaking. The flood, of course, is a scare word. It's so deeply anthrop anthropocentric that I want to ban its use. It's just the river breathing deeply as it must. On this view, we would understand a flooding of settlements on or near the river on the floodplain as the result of Homo sapiens encroaching on the natural floodplain of the river, an act, if you like, of trespass. The periodic flooding of the floodplain is the life world and condition of existence of all species that inhabit the river or who dwell along the river. And this image is, is probably hard to make out, but um, what it does is to distinguish the rise of the water into the floodplain and to different areas along the bank uh, and, its, it, and its later recession. Uh, and I might add that the earliest form of agri agriculture was flood recession agriculture in which people still practiced in Burma, uh, in which you, and elsewhere, in which you, um, take advantage of the flood because it provides silt and it kills uh, competing vegetation and you're able to just broadcast seeds as you follow the recession of the flood back into its channel. Fish, for example, get as much as 80% of their total annual nutrition from the huge pulse of food that the flood stage affords as they spread out over the floodplain. They, they spawn, they put on weight, they feed on the invertebrates and, and invertebrates and decaying organic matter and the microbes that are on the floodplain. There's a huge migration of fish often to take advantage of this feeding frenzy. frenzy. And a dramas fish, salmon, alwife, herring, shad, not to mention non seagoing fish, rush for the food. In some cases, the floodplain may be 40 times wider than the channel. It's not uncommon. In Amazon, the huge variation in the, um, uh, the height of the water, the depth of the water during flood is so massive that um, fruit eating fish have evolved because when the water reaches the lower branches of trees along the bank, these fish have evolved to uh, eat the fruit, the low hanging fruit, if you like, 
um, that is along the bank. Uh, <clears throat> the Mississippi fish, ca fish catch had declined 83% over 50 years, but after the 1993 massive flood, the fish catch was a new record. The studies of the Danube have shown that the greater the extent of the flood in a given year, the greater the fish haul the year after. And it's worth noting that as the flood recedes, it brings back a great deal of that nutrition into the channel so that the clams, um, uh, the channel catfish, uh, the forms of life that can't leave the channel of the river easily uh, are then treated to a meal that has been gathered from the floodplain by the flood process itself and deposited back in the channel. So the flood, even for those uh, forms of life that remain in the channel and do not go onto the floodplain, their life depends in an equal measure on the nutrition brought back by the floodplain. And by the way, it's not just fish, a whole cavalcade of those creatures that depend on such a concentration of nutrition. Waterfowl, riverine uh, wet birds, uh, muskrats, wolves, raptors, herbivores coming for the fresh grass sprouting after the flood recedes, and all the microparasites that feed on this cavalcade. So what the flood does in a sense is to provide connectivity it moves water over the landscape, creating a huge variety of habitats. It creates backwaters, ponds, marsh environments. And of course, the beavers did that too. Slow moving warmer water, refugees from larger predators, uh, varied assemblages of food and habitat that favor many, many different riverine species. The whole mechanism depends on the microbial richness of the floodplain and that represents the basis of the food pyramid for the entire life world of the river. Without the flood pulse then, the river is comparatively dead. Now, I mean to emphasize non-human species here, uh, partly to correct um, what I see as a anthropocentric attention to rivers uh, that uh, is not entirely warranted. Uh, I mean to emphasize non-human species, but let me say a bit about what the flood pulse does for Homo sapiens, the most numerous and most successful invasive the world has ever known. Well, civilization in a word, no floodplain, no civilization. That's not, that's 95% true. <laughs> uh, almost without exception, all archaic civilizations were found on floodplains often near the estuary of a river. Why? The only place where you can have a concentration of foodstuffs and people in a small circumference in which state making is possible. See what the flood does. It drowns all the competing vegetation. It lays down a layer of nutritious silt that provides the fertilizer, usually for a cereal grain. It provides, if well-behaved as in the Nile Valley generally, a perfectly harrowed field ready for sowing, no plowing is needed. Hence, the oldest forms of agriculture were flood repression agriculture. This is true of the eastern woodland cultivation along streams. Let me. There we go. That would be one of those places where one would find Native American cultivation. Um, on the, even the small little floodplains along rather relatively small streams. Um, this is a, uh, a huge island in the middle of the Irrawaddy River uh, that is a flood recession uh, site of agriculture for six or seven villages, something like 280 acres um, and villages um, have struggled for a long time about who has the rights to cultivate this island when the flood tide recedes and it becomes an enormously rich uh, and fertile floodplain. Uh, they actually build, I might add, a one and a half mile bamboo bridge every year because it has to be rebuilt um, uh, in order to access this island 
uh, in an easy and quick way. Um, the, uh, I should add, and I'll go through this quickly in order to save time, that um, the, the wetlands created by uh, swamps and marshes and so on, created by uh, rivers, uh, have also been places of refuge for people trying to run away from the state. Um, so uh, to give you a couple of very brief examples, um, this, the famous Marsh Arabs <clears throat> south of Basra um, were a 2000 year accumulation of people who ran away from conscription, from taxes, from failed rebellions or criminals that were sought by the state um, and so on. Uh, and they accumulated uh, in this area that, uh, and, and they became a kind of ethnic group in, in their exile, if you like, because they adapted to the swampy conditions uh, south of Basra in the wetlands. Um, this is an example of most many of their um, dwellings and even villages were in fact actually floating, large floating rafts, as you can see from this. Um, and they created, this is the, the, the if you like, the um, receiving Roman palace of a Marsh Arab sheikh um, made entirely with reeds. It has this un, extraordinary cathedral-like look to it. And every year, a new floor has to be put down because the floor uh, that floats on the water is constantly disintegrating and it has to be replaced every particular year. Saddam Hussein drained um, the marshes south of Basra, almost all of them. And uh, these people are now beggars or homeless in uh, Basra um, and uh, in Baghdad. Another example quickly is the Great Dismal Swamp uh, between um, Virginia and North Carolina. And at the outset of the Civil War, there were more than 6,000 escaped slaves living in the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, those people who didn't make it to the North or to Canada, uh, and many of the people who lived there had never seen a white person. Um, they had grew up, uh, if you like, in the Great uh, Dismal Swamp. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, after she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, wrote uh, The Great Dismal Swamp, the dread. Um, and uh, it was actually her apology for some of the errors that she thought she was responsible for in Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, and very much uh, worth reading. Just a picture of her. One last example uh, is um, people familiar with Chinese culture uh, will uh, have read the Water Margin novel, which is a great, um, almost like a Western saga of 108 heroes um, who are either magistrates who've been uh, falsely accused and arrested in a runaway um, bandits. It's rather like Robin Hood um, uh, and his band of people who are seeking refuge. And this is the Huai River Delta uh, between the Yangtze and the Yellow River. And you can actually buy um, a deck of cards each of which, um, this is one example, is an illustration of one of the 108 heroes who some Chinese uh, know, if you like, by heart uh, over time, since it's a classic. Uh, uh, so let me um, now move to uh, the best way of conceptualizing what naturally occurring floods do is through the field of disturbance ecology. I don't like the term disturbance here because it risks obscuring the fact that floods are often annual, natural, predictable floods. That is to say, they're not disturbances at all, or 
such disturbances are normal, periodic routine. But it's proposed in contradistinction, contradistinction to equilibrium analysis in which the succession and distribution of fish and insects and birds reached is a terminal state that is stable. As we shall see, it's the prevention, the forceful stopping of these natural perturbations that is the real disturbance. That's the real intervention, the attempt to enforce permanent equilibrium, to take the movement that I referred to at the beginning uh, of the talk and stop it or discipline it or uh, have it obey the Army Corps of Engineers or uh, the human landscapers. These floods create new mosaics of plants and animals and insects. They open the canopy, <clears throat> destroy or replace many species. They begin a new succession of colonists. The result is more biodiversity <clears throat> in terms of species. This mosaic of patches is far more resilient. <clears throat> it admits then flood adapted marine life, flood adapted insect life, flood adapted flora, seeds have been, that have been waiting a long, long time, quick colonizing species from adjacent peach, uh, patches, a favorable spawning environment for a great deal uh, of insects, birds, and fish. It cre creates then the innumerable, what, anthrop what ecologists call edge environments or ecotones that are, as we know, species rich because they provide access to two or more environments, sometimes seasonally. That's what happens without humans. Humans can use and shape this process as they did in the Nile, of course, by just making a slot in the natural levees of the Nile every year at flood tide um, and letting the water go down the back slope where they practice their agriculture. It's, by the way, worth noting the, the parallel between flood recession agriculture on the one hand and what's called shifting cultivation or Swidden or fire field agriculture on the other. That is to say, in shifting cultivation still practiced widely in the world, um, the agriculturalists use fire to kill much of the previous flora and that opens the canopy. That is to say, they chop down um, the flora, um, let it dry, burn it. Um, and the ashes from the burn provide the fertilizer, that's the equivalent of the silt in a flood. Uh, and uh, the plants that uh, arrive are those plants that thrive as the result of these natural disturbances, including um, the, uh, those, those crops that grow best on disturbed soil uh, of this kind or open soil. Um, the only difference between, if you like, flood recession agriculture and fire field agriculture is that every few years, uh, the people who practice shifting cultivation or fire field agriculture have to move to a new plot. After a long period of circulation, maybe 50 years, they can come back to the original uh, and farm it again in just the same way. So if there's much enough land, it's also completely sustainable. What mankind has done, of course, has been sculpting rivers for its own purposes forever. Um, uh, think of it as um, uh, beavers with dynamite, um, earth moving machinery uh, and reinforced concrete. Uh, and it's those, if you like, protean instruments of landscape uh, that make humankind the great landscapers uh, and simplification of river, the simplifiers of river by their engineering prowess. It is, however, more like a combination of taxidermy and amputation. I say simplification because the intervention in rivers is generally for a single functional purpose. 
The Rhine is a striking example. Johann Gottfried Tula around 1800 uh, organized a treaty called the rectification of the Rhine. It was the, for the upper Rhine. Uh, and the effort was to eliminate meanders, remove barriers in the channel, confine the river to a single bed with no braids, uniform width, uniform depth, uniform speed of current if possible, and to make it into a canal so near as so far as possible. That is to say, that is to say, to make it predictable, uniform, and straight. To take a variable and turn it into a constant. The Rhine is a picture from Mark Siak's book. Uh, was shortened by 105 kilometers, and it lost 80 percent of its floodplain in the Upper Rhine. Now, a drop of water landing in Switzerland only took three days to get to Holland, whereas before it took something like 10 days. George Perkins Marsh understood this as a simple matter of physics. That is to say, let's say a river has a 1,600 mile course. Let's say that the natural channel drops 800 feet from origin to the sea. That's a drop of six inches to the mile. Say by shortening the river, cutting off all meanders, you make it only 1,200 miles long. Then the pitch is increased to eight inches to the mile. This has a tremendous effect on speed, on how much silt it carries, on the height of probable flood crests, on the erosion of banks, and so on. And if you then try to minimize floods by preventing lateral flow of the river water, of the levees, the use of levees, you increase the amount of silt carried to the mouth of the river, silting up of the Dutch estuary, for example. Other simplifications are, of course, to create hydroelectric dams, which creates a chain of lakes and still water and destroys fish migrations in both directions. And it prevents the natural conveyor belt of silt downriver and prevents its natural movement. Um, the question is, when is, how much can you do to a river and have it still be called a river? Turn it into obedient canal. Uh, it becomes a metaphysical question whether you have a river at all. Uh, in many cases, these efforts don't completely succeed. So intermittently you have a river often at flood stage. Um, the example perhaps of a, the consequences of these kinds of interventions uh, and their unintended effects um, is the pattern of flood control along the Yellow River, which is surely the most meddled with river over the longest time in the world with the possible exception of the Euphrates. Jim, I just wanted to let you know that you're at the 45 minute mark. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a growth of population and the growth of levees in order to protect that population. Um, and the deposition of silt raised the, the river bed uh, to protect the tax paying population and cultivators, the levees were raised again. As a result, the river bed rose ab above the surrounding floodplain. In Haikaifeng, along the Yellow River in Henan province. Uh, the bed of the river is 33 feet above the surrounding floodplain. You don't have a river anymore, you have an aqueduct. And as a result, uh, you have catastrophic floods uh, when this happens. Um, so, uh, let me wind up. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. Uh, I think one way of understanding what we've done to rivers and the consequences um, of uh, our intervention in rivers is to equate it to uh, and, and big floods that are catastrophic floods um, is to equate it with iatrogenic illnesses. That is to say, uh, 
the medical term for illnesses that are caused by uh, prior treatment. That is to say, side effects of prescription drugs, hospital acquired infections, superbugs, side effects of radiological treatment, complications of surgery, and so on. It's been claimed that as much as 70% of admissions to hospital in the US are for eye atrogenic conditions. Our understanding of floods and fire in this context is illuminated by a particular category of iatrogenic effects in which the successful treatment of one often modest pathology directly contributes to a massive pathology that's much harder or impossible to treat. That is to say, uh, the use of um, antibiotics, for all kinds of small uh, to, in, in livestock feed and so on, creates a resistance to antibiotics and therefore uh, selects for superbugs. In the same way, our effort for a long, long time to prevent forest fires, um, Smokey the Bear and so on, created a meant a suppression of natural fires, a natural disturbance, if you like, uh, that then um, created a situation uh, in which the combustible material became so massive that the fires you had were catastrophic. In the same way, um, the prevention of small floods by raising the riverbed, by uh, dealing with this, by building dikes higher and levees higher and so on, is like a technological lock-in that uh, does prevent small floods, but creates the, if you like, the uh, basis for massive floods that are almost impossible to um, uh, to contend with. Um, I'm going to spare you. I'm going to finish there so I have time for questions. Um, the the 1993 flood of the Mississippi uh, is a particularly good example of, uh, if you like, an iatrogenic flood caused by the chaining uh, of the Mississippi by dikes and levees and so on, uh, so that when you had a large scale flooding event, uh, its consequences were uh, far more massive than it would otherwise have been. And let me finish on a, a, a small note, partly because I was very enchanted by um, a book by Ben Goldfarb on beavers uh, recently and the way in which because there were somewhere between 100 to 200 million beavers in North America uh, when the white people arrived, exterminated largely by 1840 or so. Um, and they, uh, in the upper Midwest, among other places, um, they slowed down the river by creating, if you like, manders, uh, meanders and wetlands and so on. Uh, and uh, they are now understanding that beavers, the reintroduction of beavers as a flood prevention mechanisms in which you don't have to pay some engineer a zillion dollars to rectify uh, a bend in the river or part of a stream. Um, you can have non-human collaborators uh, create natural floodplains and uh, the deposition of silt and the raising right of waterbeds high in the uplands of a river system and it prevents uh, great floods below. So let me end there. I've uh, uh, cut out a good deal in order to be uh, follow my um, the instructions about uh, when I should stop. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. That was really excellent and fascinating. So uh, we're gonna proceed now to the Q and A period. Uh, we have approximately just under 30 minutes left. So that should give us some ample time for an interesting conversation. Um, so there's two ways in which you can raise a question or make a comment, one of which is to uh, go on camera and we'll hear your voice and it'll be recorded. The other is to submit a question via the chat. Um, to do the former, that is to say, uh, go on camera, all you need to do is if on the very bottom of your screen, there's a, a menu, the last one of which on the right is reactions. And on there, you can raise your hand electronically. It'll, it will alert me that you want to be called on. So 
we already have a few questions in the chat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a couple at a time um, so that um, Jim can handle them a couple of, at a time and we get to as many as possible. So the first one comes from Pablo Prado, who says, thanks for a fascinating talk. He couldn't help thinking about seeing like a state, the book you wrote. Uh, would you say that conventional hydrology, the same as forestry and land surveying in your book, is fraught with the heavy burden of oversimplification, thus bringing about long-term ecological destruction, disruption, excuse me. The second one comes from Tim Weissel. Um, very strong points, Jim, and very suggestive ideas for everyone's further research in the coming years and decades. Thanks for very much for sharing your ideas. Um, um, as you know, as an anthropologist, is that this is always hidden from us as individuals and as a species by quote unquote culture. This is the collections, that is the collections of memories and stories we as humans have learned to tell ourselves about ourselves and nature ever since the emergence of language among hominids. As Levi Strauss taught us all, almost all origin myths have to do with why and how it is that we as humans came to dominate, have authority over the natural world. As you have pointed out, this is particularly acute as a delusion in grain-based cultures that emerged along riverine, riverine ecosystems since the beginning of the Holocene. Okay, um, and then, okay, there's a further comment. Actually, he's got quite a bit. Um, I didn't anticipate that he's got that many. Um, the last question, though, he asks is how can we change the narrative fast enough for us to be able to understand how to change our behavior? So there you have a couple comments and or questions. Um, thanks for those. Um, to take the first one first, um, I think it's absolutely true that it's the oversimplification of the river. Um, and the effort to landscape it for a particular purpose. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, it's a perceptive question, partly because I didn't realize, maybe it's because uh, my brain is in such a groove, I didn't realize that I was ending up telling somewhat the same story about rivers as I told about scientific forestry at the beginning of Seeing Like a State that you had uh, in fact, this effort to create of the forest a uh, a new forest that in which the maximum sustainable output of board feet of lumber was the whole purpose. It was a one commodity machine. Um, there's something uh, strongly parallel in the effort to make a river a either a navigation canal. Um, a hydroelect chain of hydroelectric reservoirs uh, or a set of irrigation reservoirs uh, or as simply piped water for human beings. Um, so it's um, in a sense the, the effort to, if you like, eliminate all of the things that a river does um, uh, ended up having unintended consequences of for ecology and for, in particular, the life that lives in the river and by the river and from the river, um, much more devastating than, uh, than for human beings. Um, we were sculpting it for our purposes and as a result, took it away from migrating fish, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, with uh, Tim Weisko, I, uh, I actually um, was in a Zoom, um, thing with him last week, and he said, I thought, um, some very profound things about um, how agriculture itself is, if you like, a form of ecocide um, in the following sense, that to the degree that you have um, a set of cultivars, uh, often one being dominant, that are constantly threatened by wildlife, by weeds, by, right? Um, that is to say, 
a garden or a farm is in, in, in effect a kind of floral zoo that has to be protected almost um, uh, constantly from the encroaching of the, a larger nature. It is, if you like, a kind of, I call this the domus module in, uh, uh, in, a recent, in a recent book. And it's really important to understand the way in which it tries to exclude, uh, sometimes not entirely successfully, um, uh, wild nature, if you like, in order to preserve um, the, this artificial productive single purpose uh, garden or field of crops. Okay, we have um, a question that Brian asked. Um, why don't you go ahead? I see. Yes. Um, thank you. First of all, uh, Professor Scott, such a subtle and beautiful lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure you know well that both scientists and many hydrologists uh, consider inevitable the breakdown of the old river control structure on the Mississippi, and that such a breakdown, as you know, would not only uh, cause a disastrous flood along the Atchafalaya and destroy all kinds of uh, infrastructure along with uh, uh, Morgan City and other towns, and many Homa Indian uh, populations as well, but it would also uh, most likely set off the siltation uh, of the cancer alley area, the deep water port of New Orleans, and of course, uh, the salinification of the water supply, the fresh water supply of New Orleans itself. And what I'm wondering, since this disaster foretold is, is really considered inevitable and is part of the geological process, but at the same time, absolutely arrested and combated by the Army Corps and by the whole pattern of our civilization, I'm wondering what attitude do you think we should take towards such an event? And what should we advocate for now? Or what would you advocate for now? OK. Um, and I have a question in the, the chat from um, Maria Oliva Rios. Thanks, Dr. Scott. Is there a particular way you can think to politically produce epistemological change on the climate disruption reality from collective notions of management, basing the methodologies on the indigenous people's knowledge towards changing our perceptions and engage in intercultural dialogues that impact our species' future? So those are two questions for now. Uh, uh, thank you for those questions. Again, to take them in order, um, the, uh, I have the feeling that I could learn a lot from a conversation uh, with Brian about the Mississippi um, and the older forms of control. Um, and I think with respect to the Atchafalaya, uh, I think the only thing I've kind of read is um, what's the famous um, Oh, Control of Nature by, um, uh, I forget the name of the author, a uh, famous author um, uh, about the Army Corps engineer trying to prevent, uh, if you like, the Atchafalaya uh, outlet from the Mississippi desperately wants to move west um, and the Army Corps of Engineers has so far prevented it. It won't be successful forever. Um, and I, I think actually one of the things that is worth thinking about is what I would call there's 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 technological lock-in and then there's political lock-in. Technological lock-in is about you know you put up levees and dikes, the bed of the river rises unless it's uh, the the flow is enormously fast. Uh, then you have to raise the levees and dikes. Then it deposits more silt and so on, uh, and so it's like an arms race that. Uh, makes floods more catastrophic, uh, that I pointed out. Um, but there's a political lock-in in which once you have human communities uh, who have representation and political representatives and access to power and developers and so on, who settled on the floodplain, uh, they can organize the political system so that they get to stay in the floodplain at public expense, if you like, by 
uh, also the raising of dikes and and so on. Um, the uh, in a and and when it's necessary to, if you like, precipitate a flood in order to prevent a more catastrophic flood, and you have to destroy the dikes, um, you're likely to destroy the dikes uh, for those people with the least political power uh, who live like, you know, so that the, the people in the Plaquemine and the Lower Ninth Ward, right, um, are the most vulnerable. Uh, so that in a sense, that political lock-in uh, often protects um, the um, the most power powerful at the expense of the most vulnerable. Uh, a student of mine actually established that um, many a huge number of prisons built in the last thirty years been built on uh, vulnerable floodplains because it's cheap land um, uh, and who cares if the prisoners get flooded out. Um, the um, Maria's question, um, I think, so let me go back actually, that goes back to this question of, of a man's domination over nature. And I think that, that that doctrine is particularly strong in the monotheistic religions, um, um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and probably in Hinduism as well, um, but less so. I mean, the whole point of animism, which is, if you like, the, um, the kind of religious orientation of most indigenous peoples, the point of animism is that every natural object uh, is ascribed a certain kind of agency and will. Uh, and it seems to me that in a sense, indigenous peoples and not just in North America, but elsewhere um, had a kind of respect for the agency of natural objects like trees and mountains and rivers uh, uh, and so on uh, in, in a way that was coupled, not just with reverence, but with a close observation um, of the different uh, moods, character, uh, if you like, a kind of deep local knowledge, part of village, oral culture, and constant observation. Um, that is to say, um, it was not simply reverence, but also it was coupled with a micro understanding of the environmental world uh, around them and all of the uses to which something could be put. So that, for example, it's, it's interesting to me that, uh, that something like maize uh, we think of as being grown just for the yield and kernels. Whereas in fact, in almost any indigenous situation, it has a lots of purposes. It provides, if you like, the trellis in which climbing beans could be um, trained. Uh, it, um, uh, its leaves can be used as wrappers. The cob can be used as a scrubber. Uh, certain kinds of kernels make better porridge, whereas others uh, uh, are good for uh, other eating purposes. Some of them store longer than others and spoil less readily. So that the idea that a grain is simply that kernel and its weight. Um, it seems to me that all indigenous peoples for any flora or plant or any natural object that they use, they're aware of the large number of purposes uh, for which it can be deployed uh, because they're experienced in doing that. Uh, so I'm, I'm, it's not that Indigenous peoples have not been sculpting the landscape. It is that, and the, they have been. And it's not that they know everything about ecology. They don't. Um, the two things that are important, it seems to me, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, are that they have a much more encompassing micro knowledge of the environment around it, them. Uh, and they don't have the massive tools of dynamite and earth moving machinery uh, 
uh, to make interventions that uh, are irreversible. Great. Okay, so we have a question from Samar Alatut. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute, which you need to. Okay. Yes. Hi. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for a great um, presentation. Um, I um, since we've been um, reading this week for my class, we've been reading domination and the arts of resistance, and we also um, and recently I have reread um, Seeing Like a State. Both of them, um, both of your projects in in both of those books. Um, it, one, for example, the example that you mentioned, the simplification of the forest in scientific forestry. Um, and in domination and the arts of resistance, you try to show how, um, wh what is the kind of, um, the kind of general principles of domination from different places, right? To come up with a general kind of understanding of what domination is. And it seems that you are trying to do something along those lines now with the floods and rivers, right? My, my, uh, my question to you in the other two works, um, history always mattered, right? Um, so the simplification of forests had to do with the emergence of a state in a specific place at a specific time with specific scientific um, forestry. Um, in domination and the arts of resistance, also it had a lot to do, and it's about social life, right? But so it had a lot of politics in it and it, a lot of human centered kind of frameworks. But in this project, um, I'm worried about the effect of it. It seemed to, and I was wondering if you can speak to that. It seemed to flatten a number of things. One is history, um, space, rivers, floods, to the degree that all of those seem to be the same everywhere else. And that, and so, and the human, right? And so there isn't, um, there doesn't seem to be a, a link between the social and the natural kind of elements in conjunction with one another. So floods, they don't happen the same way everywhere that they happen. They always happen in a specific place with a specific result, with specific um, kind of structures that allow them or do not allow them, and then with specific responses. And all of that will make us understand or think about social relations within which floods happen. So I was wondering if there is aspect of your research that actually does that work that has been done before in your work very wonderfully. Um, yeah. Thank you. And thank you again. So we don't have another question currently lined up. Um, okay. So that so, so otherwise... that um, I want to make um, to Summer's uh, point. I, I want to agree with it uh, and make an historical point of how things have changed. Uh, that is to say, uh, I, sh I should add that my most recent book, Against the Grain, is an effort to understand the very earliest agrarian states in Mesopotamian uh, alluvium. So I have been, I, I think of my uh, intellectual career as I started out as a political science, ran away to anthropology, and now I've run away from anthropology to history, and I find myself in you know 4,000, 5,000 BC in the Mesopotamian alluvium, where I have very little firsthand knowledge or research or, or linguistic skills, um, but driven to much longer, uh, if you like, uh, stretches of understanding historical change. So I'd make this. I make this point that you are correct um, about each flood, each intervention in a river as being historically specific, contextual to a particular social and culture, cultural milieu. But I would add this, and that is that the engineering of rivers for Homo sapiens purposes for at least two centuries now has been 
increasingly unified by international professions of hydrologists, engineers, um, dam builders. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that when a dam is, let's say, built in 1910 in Niger, um, not only is it a colonial situation, but even the, uh, the Nigerian um, uh, are part of an international society of hydrological engineers. They go to international conferences. They read the same textbooks. They've often been trained at the same places. And so it seems to me that, that in a sense, the growth of expertise and an international, not that there aren't disputes, um, but it seems to me that in a sense, the individual specificity is contaminated increasingly by an international consortium of dam builders and hydrological engineers who share the same background and the same purposes. Uh, and, and they are actually to design the river for the immediate purposes of homo sapiens. Um, and, and not for the flora and fauna and fish and birds uh, that are dependent on the river. So I think, although your point is correct, it becomes less correct in recent history um, than it used to be. Uh, by the way, I should add in, in um, uh, Mark Elvin's book, called um, Retreat, Retreat of the Elephants, which is a 4,000 year uh, environmental history of China. Uh, he has an interesting chapter on rivers in which he distinguishes between Confucian river masters and Taoist river masters. The Confucian river masters are more or less like the Army Corps of Engineers that we're gonna make the river do what we want it to do by right um, earthworks and so on. Uh, and the Taoist river masters, um, uh, although they want to influence uh, the river uh, and move it in certain directions, they understand the limits of their capacity to do that. And so they create things like um, large weirs that only move when the flow of the river becomes as a certain force that would open, if you like, the gate automatically. Um, and so that they, if you like, um, they try to cooperate to the greatest possible extent with the river to achieve some of the same purposes. Um, so, and I, and it's not, I, I want to add that there are lots of different reasons to sculpt rivers um, and that there are lots of differences among these specialists, uh, but it's quite rare. Um, it's not as if there's a huge, uh, number of hydro hydrological engineers who are interested in the life of the fish and bivalves and water birds and waterfowl uh, of the river and maximizing their welfare. All right, well, we currently don't, oh, we do have a new question. Uh, for, again, from Tim Weiskel. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Jim, this is fantastic stuff. In fact, your whole trajectory of recent works have been fantastic in inviting us to reinsert the human into the ecosystemic uh, processes. Um, there was a couple of people on the Yale faculty who we both knew who've been working on this for a while and we're in a sense catching up to them, or at least I am. Um, you've already gotten there, I think. But guys like G. Evelyn Hutchinson um, understood this a long time ago and used to hold forth in the Lizzie Club about it um, on Thursday afternoons. We'd, we'd show up and take notes as fast as we could, but we couldn't catch up. He basically started off as a limnologist uh, studying things like um, sediments and lakes. And uh, my brother, Peter, took that more seriously than I, and he's now the head of USGS uh, groundwater hydrology for all of New England, uh, looking into these things. And in fact, um, he basically uh, put the narrative forward by the beaver that you may have um, 
uh, read about and, and seem to have embraced, if not read about it, uh, yourself. That is, they were the, the original water managers of the Northeast. Um, and in fact, the blowing up of the beaver dams uh, changed the hydrology of the whole Northeast and made the Industrial Revolution a fluke because basically it was only the continuous flow through New England rivers that made Lowell uh, possible as a, um, a mill town. Uh, once you had the increase of flashiness because you got rid of the, the um, steady flow with the slow melt of the ice pack and the gradual uh, throughput of a managed water system, uh, the flashiness meant that they had to move from water power to petroleum to um, get those mills to, to work after water power was no longer reliable. It wasn't that it wasn't there, it just was there in a much more, as the geologists call it technically, a flashy uh, presence. It came through in floods um, and the right. spring flood and the mud and like. Anyway, the ecological history of water in the Northeast would be a fascinating study for us to challenge Bill Cronin to uh, rethink his, his material on uh, because he and I started, as you may recall, uh, getting the environmental program going at Yale as an interdisciplinary effort, making sure that it didn't end up in any one department, but making sure that it had to be across several departments and keep talking with each other in these things. He went out and did stuff further on Chicago and got lost in the Midwest somewhere, uh, back <laughs> in the origins where you started out in Wisconsin. But it was their invitation on um, <laughs> the, the University of Wisconsin's part for me to come out and give a series of lectures there that got me going on trying to talk with Bill about the importance of the arrogance of humanism in reference to ecosystems. We still, as, as <laughs> the great zoologist Ehrenfeld put it in his book called The Arrogance of Humanism, we know that we're no longer the center of the ecosystem, but we still proceed as if the law of gravity be, had been put in place in order to make it easier for us to sit down. <laughs> what okay. I think you've, you've accomplished through the entire trajectory of your works and now your great continuing agrarian seminar series is to reinvite us to listen to the peasant on the one hand, but even prior to that, to the 99% of human history that was spent in <laughs> before the Holocene in the foraging state. And this is what Levi Strauss taught us in Paris for years. I had you know, the chance to study with him because EP um, from the anthro department at, at uh, Oxford introduced me to him. Um, and so I spent a lot of time trying to scribble notes in Paris from the Collège de France on his insights about the wisdom, which is written up partially in the book called Man the Hunter. Uh, he reflects very poignantly on how the greatest philosophers were not Plato and the like. They, that came along in the agricultural period, but the philosophers were present among those who understood the complexities of nature and lived within them. Thanks very much for all this stimulating stuff. And we'll try to catch up with each other, I think a little bit later on some of these things. Okay, and I have a final question from Joel Rogers. You need to unmute. I apologize, and you might want to just end with, with the last remark of, uh, of gratitude for the talk and, and of your contribution. But let me, let me just annoy you with a question, which is, uh, uh, I, I personally like to keep uh, the human race around, if only for its future possibilities uh, to create beauty and, and some more knowledge and, and learn how to live better together with themselves and, and with nature. I premise with you uh, that we have a vast amount to learn from the attitude and the knowledge, the microscopic understanding of different ecosystems, et cetera, of indigenous peoples who in general survived as long as they had because they had a culture which was much more respectful of each other and with nature. And I also premise with you that uh, 
uh, you know, modern man with his Pleistocene brain and uh, all these modern toys has been an incredibly destructive force um, in the world. I, I totally agree with you. But I'd still like to keep it around. I, I, maybe you can tell me if you want to keep it around. But assuming you do, uh, what's what's the program? What are the takeaways we should take away from from what you've been saying? What I take away is you should really stop harming the biosphere. You know, starting with the transition to to clean energy. You should probably reduce your incursion on the rest of nature but through more compact settlement of the sort that's already going on in cities. And then you should uh, systematically encourage people to not be dicks to each other, you know, by supporting democracy and, and educating people as much as you can. Do you have a different uh, program going forward? But, but first with whether the human race is worth keeping around. Um, well, I'm, I wanna keep the human race around because I'm part of it. I don't want to abolish myself. Um, well, so, uh, well, we, uh, start right. there. Sorry, I, I'm going to the, the broader temporal lens that you were right. suggesting. Right, okay. The so let, let me address that. Two things occur to me off the top of my head. One of them is that um, we are increasingly aware every day that there are limits to our control over the natural world and that we have set in motion a whole series of changes uh, which perhaps are irreversible um, and you know all these extreme events and so on have are starting to result I don't want to be too optimistic about this um, in for example uh, the denial of insurance um, uh, in floodplains um, the uh, if you like, a kind of retreat if, uh, in many ways, right? From the idea that our job uh, is to protect everyone from uh, natural environmental harm that we have brought on ourselves by our historic interventions. Now, it seems to me that what's more important, I suppose, is that, you know, there were if I've got this right, in 1750, the year 1750, there were less than three quarters of a billion of us. And just a couple hundred years, I mean, so, so late, if you like, in the history of the earth and of Homo sapiens even, um, there are now going on eight billion of us. And the idea that that eight billion, uh, are all entitled to a lower middle class life um, um, is, it seems to me, incomprehensible, right? Uh, in terms of the natural limits of the environment. And I also understand that eliminating one American uh, uh, would be the ecological equivalent of um, uh, 60 Bangladeshis, right? Um, that is to say, we are much more of a burden on the planet than uh, people who consume less of the earth's resources and make less demands on its products. Um, it, but it seems to me that quite apart from changing our, if you like the aspirations of what things like the American dream mean, um, it seems to me that um, we ought to be on a glide path to a population that is something like half of what it is now. Um, and in part, we're doing this by contaminating the water and lower sperm counts uh, and lower fertility uh, and so on. So perhaps it's happening naturally, but I wouldn't depend on it. Uh, but it seems to me that it's inconceivable that 8 billion people can be supported in a decent human way um, indefinitely without destroying the planet. Uh, now, uh, how you get onto a glide path to let's say 3 billion. Um, I mean, I have a short list of people we could start with, of course, um, but uh, it, it doesn't, 
it doesn't it doesn't add up to the uh, numbers that we require. But it seems to me there there are too many of us, um, and uh, and and too many of us have aspirations to resource uses uh, and styles of life that are intolerable for planetary limitations. And I don't, I do not believe, I mean, I'm, I, I understand that there are a whole series of geoengineers who want to uh, launch reflecting uh, panels in uh, into the stratosphere, who want to dump billions of iron filings in the ocean. Um, and those, that, that, those solutions are even more terrifying to me, right? Uh, than our current situation. Okay, well, that's that's one note to end this on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're very grateful to you. Thanks so much for this. Um, and thanks to everybody who participated. Again, the, a, a recording of this will be available on our website before long, and you can alert your friends to that and colleagues, uh, as well as seeing it again yourself. So uh, I just wanted to make one last plug for our um, events coming up in the next couple of weeks. Next week, Eileen Boris, um, professor of feminist studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, will be giving two lectures under the overarching title, Home as a Workplace. And again, that's very timely. Um, those talks are on Tuesday and Thursday of next week at 12 noon central time. And then in two weeks, my consul of the Roosevelt Institute will be giving a talk titled, Why Freedom Requires Keeping Us From the Market. And that's on Thursday, October 14th, again at 12 noon central time. So thanks very much to everybody. I hope you can join us for those in subsequent. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to thank everybody for, uh, who came for coming and express my gratitude that it was nice to visit Madison again, Madison again even if only virtually. Thanks very much. It was, it was great to have you here. All right. Thanks, Jen. All right. So again, you can register for those other talks on our website. Thanks so much to Jim, especially, and to all of you. Take care. <laughs>